Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Um, when I finished up last time, I just got my US citizenship and I was headed for selection. Let me let me back up a little bit and, and talk about Germany real quick again. Because every time I do this, um, like I said, I have no script. I'm just kind of pulling things out of my head and I think of things after they were... Uh, after it's done. So when I was in Germany, I had um, a soldier in my squad for about a year, maybe more. And I say a year because I spent nine months in Kosovo and he, he worked for me. And, I, you know, a squad leader has eight soldiers under him. He has two sergeants and then six privates uh, broken into two fire teams. So this guy came in kind of late. He was an older guy, probably 30. And... He was not a good soldier. He seemed like he was smart enough, but he was a bit of a dirtbag. And he was hanging out with dirtbags. And like I said, we had massive problems with drugs in Germany, just the way it was. Guys would drive up into Amsterdam, buy a bunch of marijuana, mostly, I think, and then drive back. And uh, they'd really tried to crack down on it. So I had this guy in my squad for a year. I tried to motivate him. I tried to smoke him. I tried to mentor him. And... He'd do okay for a while, and then he'd get in trouble, and blah, blah, blah. So eventually, he took a urinalysis and failed it. He burned it, and he was getting chaptered out of the army, kicked out. Now, at that time, I went back to the United States to go to the qualification course. I didn't hear what happened. Then a couple of years later, I was in Fort Benning, and I ran into his roommate. He was also in my squad, longer than him, like two years in my squad. But I ran into the guy who was his roommate in the barracks, and he told me, that he had run into him years after he got kicked out of the army for smoking dope. Um, and he was in uniform and he was a warrant officer in the army. And he was like, what the hell? And this guy was like, hey, come talk to me. And he sat down, he told him the whole story. He was an undercover CID agent in my squad for a year in Germany. Um, CID is Criminal Investigation Division, the, the investigators. So because of the drugs they had in input this guy in as a specialist, even though he was a warrant officer, and he had spent a year or more getting smoked by me, getting yelled at by me, and kind of feeding information to the MP. I used to think it was weird because we'd do what we call a health and welfare, and we'd lock down the whole barracks, and we'd take people down to search their cars, and, and they'd bring MPs in. And the MPs, in some case, walk straight up the stairs into the guy's room, straight into the bathroom, and the, the lint dryers they had for, for the, the drying of their clothes, drugs would be laced in there so the dog couldn't smell them. And they'd find them, boom, straight to them. I was like, damn, these guys are good. And didn't know that I had an undercover agent in my squad for a year. It's crazy. Um, but when we were uh, in Kosovo, I mentioned this book here that Nate Self wrote. He was my platoon leader in Kosovo. And when we were there, we did a big raid on a Albanian guerrilla terrorist training camp. It was they were they had uniforms, they had weapons, they had booby traps out, and it was a base to train a guerrilla force. And you know we got intel somehow. I I can't remember how, but we had to go hit it and, and take it down. Our our company, so it was a big mission. We got SEAL Team 2, I think, came in and stayed at our base, and then they infilled and put Overwatch on it for a couple of days. So we had pretty good intel. We rolled up there, and we dismounted, moved up, and did a call-out, but, like, from the worst position you could think of. We were down on this slope, and they could have just thrown hand grenades over, but the the guys that were there, a couple of them had bugged out, uh, hauled ass, and got, got stopped by a blocking position. The There was a... Stars and Stripes reporter with us and he was staying with our company commander and I was supposed to I was on this four day rotation that we talked about last time and you know you, you'd work for three days and you get a day off and you go back and call home I was supposed to call home and I wasn't able to because we were doing rehearsals and we were mission planning and we were getting ready to do this hit so a couple of days later I call home and uh, I talked to my wife and I'm like yeah I couldn't call you last time and she said yeah I know because you were raiding a, a, a terrorist training camp and I was like what how did you know that and she said your picture is on the front page of stars and stripes newspaper 
And I was like, what? And, and I posted that. I'll post it again on my Instagram. It's that the Stars and Stripes reporter took a photograph while we were raiding that thing. And I have a pistol in my hand because I had a big M16 and it's too big for clearing buildings. So I just slung it and I pulled out my sidearm and I was using that. But that, that's a live shot from the hit. The, um, the Stars and Stripes reporter wrote this big elaborate story about the mission. And it was all BS, honestly. It was actually a good mission, a good hit. But as it evolved... The company commander was in the same room as the the reporter, and the reporter made him sound like, oh my God, like a ninja. I wish I kept those newspaper clippings, but they, they said, at one point, the, the, the SEALs who were in Overwatch reported that guys were putting in booby traps anywhere, and we flexed uh, a couple of squads over there, and they rolled them up. But when the report came out, uh, it said that the company commander dived out of the helicopter, training one, his pistol on one while tackling the other company man, it wasn't even there. Like, it was a joke. And it was disgusting the way it was written up. Um, but a funny thing. But it, it, that, that whole raid and that whole hit and that whole deployment to Kosovo is, is very well covered in Nate's book, which is Two Wars, this one. Um, but I just want to, he sent me a copy of this book and I hadn't heard from him in years, but he wrote on the cover on the inside, he said, Patty, you're a great man and an even better NCO. I look forward to linking up soon. I couldn't write a book without you in it. Only drawback is the publisher wouldn't let me speak your mind, which means I was always a loudmouth asshole, I guess. But there's a piece in it here where he talks about that raid and he references me. He says, if we had to go in, Sergeant Kevin Owens' squad would be the first ones in. Across from me, in the bed of the five-ton truck, Owens expressed his angst. I was pissed off. Um, he was my best squad leader, a former Irish Special Forces soldier, as well as a freelance bodyguard in Mogadishu in 92 93. The contentious former military, sorry, the contentious former mercenary brewed his thoughts as boldly as he brewed his tea and he offered them up just as freely, <laughs> which means I pretty much said whatever the hell came in my back. I have no filter. Sorry. I always been like that, but a uh, great guy and a uh, great book. Actually, if you want to understand PTSD, which is a very difficult thing to understand, um, and it, 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 when I read it, it really did put it in perspective for me, because I, I, I knew this guy, and he was he was a he was a warrior, and it, it crushed him. Um, so four years in Germany, great time. If you're in the military and you get a chance to go overseas, jump on it. it it's a freaking great time. You we drove. We we didn't have a lot of money. As I gained more rank and deployed, and, and, and I built up a little bit of money, but we could drive down from Vilsack in, in southern Germany, down through Garmisch, and all the way to into Italy. Every year we did this, and we stayed, we camped. Uh, you get fuel, because fuel is so expensive in Europe. You got fuel coupons, so you could buy fuel at American prices, and you could go to like Vincenza, and, and it's in, in uh, Venice, and you could buy fuel there, and you camp there for a couple of days, go down to Pisa, hit Rome, and, and it, it's phenomenal. It used to drive me crazy when young privates would get two weeks off in Germany, and they'd sit in their room and play video games, or they'd go home to see mom. Man, you're in Europe. Go travel. Go see the world. Um, but getting an opportunity to serve overseas like that, and you get what's called cost of living allowance because it's more expensive in, in Europe, and um, so your pay goes up a little bit, and you don't have to... You still had access to the PX on post where you could buy food and all that. So you didn't have to buy all that stuff on the German economy, but they did reimburse you for it. So it was a it was a good uh, phase of my army career, and and I made uh, staff sergeant there. So after I came back from Kosovo, I had to go back to Fort Benning for six weeks to a non commissioned officer leadership school. And this is before 9-11. It was kind of a waste of time. It wasn't very good. Um, but, hey, just one of those things. I've learned something in every single school I've ever done. So I get my U.S. citizenship and the Army, or not the Army, the government banned my wife from the, the country for 10 years. So I have to go to airborne school by myself while she stays back in Germany with no household goods and no car. So we made sure we got her a car and we got her a place to stay but she was kind of stuck there for now. I went to Airborne School, Fort Benning, Georgia, um, static line jump school, two weeks of ground training, one week of jumping. Um, 
And then I reported to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to do the Q course. I'd already passed selection. Um, the, the Q course at that time, and it has changed a lot. Um, at that time was six phases. The first phase was considered selection. That was done. The second phase was small unit tactics, a six-week course in patrolling, ambushes, raids, all that stuff. When I was an infantry squad leader, I knew how to do all that stuff already, but I had to go through it. Um, the third phase was your MOS, your military occupation specialty. In my case, 18 Bravo, Special Forces Weapon Sergeant. And that was about four months, I think. Then the next phase was Robin Sage, which is a culmination exercise, scenario-based exercise in a, in a fictional country, which was, was pretty awesome. Then you went to a language school for four to six months or whatever, whatever depending on your language. And then you went to SEER school, uh, survival school, and then you graduated and went to your group. So from the start of the Q course SUT to the end, it took me about 10 months to get through the whole thing, which was really, really quickly. It's much longer now, mostly because people have to wait weeks between phases because it's just a big, massive machine of hundreds and hundreds of soldiers moving through. When I got there... Um, Straight from airborne school, straight there, signed in, and, and got a uh, SUT date fairly, fairly quickly. Now, it is in the fall of 2002 at this point. So a lot of SF guys, a lot of Green Berets that were instructors on, on, in SWIC on the Q course were getting pulled back to their group to go deploy especially guys from fifth group and third group, and they were getting pulled back and, and sent back. And they augmented the instructors with National Guard guys. Now, they're National Guard SF guys. They went all the, through the, the same training, the same Q course, but they were terrible instructors. They, again, they had no, um, they had no clue what they were doing. It, it was bad. And it wasn't just that they didn't know the, the material, which they didn't. They were just a-holes. And they thought that in the absence of teaching, you just smoke people and make them do flutter kicks. Like, I laugh. I learned, in SUT, I learned how to do flutter kicks. Um... Because that's all we do. In particular, the, the guy who was in charge of my squad had no freaking clue. And I, and I knew what I was doing, but they, they were just, it, it's not how it was supposed to be done. They considered that the instructors there, where I worked later on, they considered it part of selection. So they're trying to weed people out, even though people had already passed selection. And then you were in 18-man squads, hundreds of, I think I had like 300 people or something in my um SUT class because we were flooding. We we're trying to build up the regiment because of 9-11. So um, six weeks of patrolling and raids and ambushes and all that, but just badly done. I remember one time we were in the field and a massive ice storm came in. This is 2002. It was one of the biggest ice storms in about like 100 years. And the, there was big chunks of ice and snow falling from the tree. Somebody's going to get killed. So eventually they, they took us back to Camp McCall because we were in the field. And when we got back there, the power was out. So we had about three days of sleep. At least we were indoors, but no electricity, eating MREs. There was no chow hall. So when the power came on eventually, the place was trashed. There was pine straw everywhere. And we, were, we would have cleaned it up. But before we had a chance, the instructor came in. And he lost his mind because that's all they did. Um, we had our, our bay that we stayed in, it had two sections. It had a sleeping bay where all the beds were, and then it had a planning bay in the front with sand table, um, you know, charts and graphs, a classroom. It, it was actually really well laid out. Um, he told us to move the planning bay into the sleeping bay and move the sleeping bay into the planning bay. And it took us all night long to do that. And the next morning he came and he said, okay, move it back, just to be a dick. Um, it, it, it was not a good experience on, in SUT. You had instructors there who were completely disgruntled because they had to work there and they just take it out on the students. And I know this because I worked there later on and I, I know how things were done. The, and I'll get to that when I get to that portion. The, um, most of the instruction was done by guys like me who were experienced infantry guys um, who were in that squad. And we did most of the teaching while the instructors just went home. It was badly run. It was badly managed. And the, the cadre that were there were 
had a chip on the shoulder. And, and this is how it worked back then and my whole career. And I assume it still works that way. When you've been on a team, let's say you're a green brand, you're on a team for a couple of years and you're the senior guy in that company. The swick levy comes down, which means these guys need to, the, all these senior guys need to go and be instructors at the qualification course. Now, it's a great system in that you're constantly churning over, you're constantly bringing new guys back who've been to war, and you're constantly updating that, the, that program, and you're getting new guys in there. Now, it's a three-year tour to go to SWIC, and you can't get out of it. The only way to get out of it is to die. Um, but when that levy list comes down, generally guys like me who had a good reputation, a lot of skills, a lot of combat time, and on the schools necessary, we pick where we want to go. So I go, I want to be a sniper instructor. So I go to sniper school, and even if they don't know me, with a couple of phone calls, they can find out everything about me. And if they want you, they'll pull you before you even come out on where you're going to go, right? And this happens across the regiment, free fall school, dive school, Sephardic, Sniper School, all the really, really high-end schools. Now, that leaves guys who don't have a good reputation, don't have the skills, or just didn't bother finding a job. They get pushed to SUT or selection or to be cadre at student company, and it's a shit job. Like, it really is. The SUT, working at SUT, which I did, is a lot of hard work. And um, so they get mad, they get pissed off, and they take it out on the students. So that, that was going on hard when I was at the at small unit tactics. They had dropped so many people from the Q course or from small unit tactics. At the end, I think we had, we might have had 350 or something like that in my class. But I remember being in formation and they were trying, they were like, does anybody want to quit? This is not going to stop, not going to stop. And you'd be thinking, nobody's going to quit. I had nowhere to go. I, I'd never thought of quitting, but you'd You'd hear movement to your left and right and behind you and droves of people would just move out and be like, I'm done. And and a lot of it was, um, they were just quitters, right? But sometimes they were really, really good soldiers, E7s from Ranger Battalion that were like, this is BS. I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. Um, and it got to the end and they had dropped so many people. And let's say, my numbers are probably off, but let's say it was 300 in our class. They like... 100 quit they failed another 100 it's not rocket science it's basic patrolling they failed another 100 and graduate a third of the class and the chain of command came in and said no that's not happening that 100 you failed half of them are going to graduate you pick who or we will and of course that you'll get the ncos and they, they were like oh my god the officers trying to make a quota but if you don't do your job your job is to train people Right now, sometimes people get through selection and they just can't cut it in SUT and they just make mistake after mistake after mistake. But generally, that that's more of the exception than the rule. And these guys get so uh, badge protectors, right? They want to kick. Oh, he's not. And some of these guys, if they had themselves as an instructor on the Q course, they wouldn't pass. And I've seen it my whole career. And like I said last time, if I can elevate my achievement and make it sound really tough, then it makes me more of a badass, right? Well, I did it, but you're not, you know, not. it's not for everybody, this kind of BS, right? So, and I've seen it in every school I've ever went to. So they had failed so many people that um, uh, they were told half of those guys. And there was one guy in particular who was in my squad. He was a Navy diver who went to Delta Force selection and Delta Force Q course but he's from the Navy, so the Army needed to get him an Army MOS, so they sent him to the Q course. And um, the guy was a freaking rock star, man. And you don't pass Delta for selection if you're not, put it that way. So he was there to get an Army MOS. Now, he didn't know much about patrolling, but the guy was smart. He was phys He was an ultra-marathon runner. He was physically fit, motivated, funny. He was a great dude. And they, they, they got a chip on their shoulder with him because he was a Delta operator, right? You get these weak-ass NCOs that are intimidated by him. So they failed him at the end, even though he finished the whole thing. And uh, then when they were told by the chain of command that half the people you failed are going forward, they got pissed off. So they told, they pulled them all in and said, if you get pushed forward, you better 
volunteer to recycle or we will put the word out on you on the Q course and you there'll be a hit on you and you'll fail the next cycle. And he was going to do that. He was going to, to volunteer to re and I said, do not do that, man. This is not SF. This is screw these guys, man. Move forward. And he did. And in the next phase, they actually did come and talk to our cadre and and our cadre said, hey, it's not my fault if you couldn't train him. And, and shut them down. Good for them. Uh, Tony Yost, man, good for you. Um, so there was, this, there was this nasty element there who just looked at students like they were trash. And it's not all of them, right? You had great instructors, too, who really did the right thing and really wanted to mentor and train people. But that was more the exception at the time and not the rule. Um, it was not a good experience. It was not well run. I don't know what it's like now, but it put a sour taste in my mouth for the whole Q course. And that was the six-week small unit tactics course. It was so ridiculous. Let me give you an example. Like when you were put in an ambush, um, there was certain criteria that you would be graded on, right? And you'd move up and you'd set out your security on the sides, right? You set out your early warning. And then you'd, you'd set up your machine gun teams and then you'd put everybody in. If you were moving along the line laterally, even though you had early warning on on both sides of this road, um, if you moved laterally along the line, they would fail you. You had to, like if I had to go from where I was, this is the guy that I had. If I had to go from where I was, like 10 feet to the right, I had to go all the way back, like 50 feet into the wood line, move across and then move up. So you didn't move laterally along the ambush line, even though you had early warning out. And then when your ambush line was set in, I think it had to be 100 meters by doctrine, right? And then the machine guns had to cover 50% each, right? And then all the rifles had their sector to fire, so the whole ambush line is, is covered. What they would do is, my guy, he would go out, he had 100 meters of engineer tape, and he would put that left gun on its, it's on a tripod, so it, it locks in at the leftmost uh, sector of fire and then the right. And he would measure with his engineer tape and if your if your ambush line wasn't 100 meters long then you failed and if it was 90 you failed if it was more than that you failed and then he'd measure each gun position to make sure each machine gun covered 50 percent it's just ridiculous way of doing things ambushers aren't like that in the real world um there's nothing wrong with having standards but the standards got to be based in reality and and almost all those instructors wouldn't be able to do the tasks that they were grading us on but anyway, I moved forward and I graduated that and I just put it behind me and moved on. The next phase I went to was phase three was MOS training. And that was the Special Forces Weapons Sergeant course. I went there and we all we were on a formation early on in the course. Now, this is light and heavy weapons from all over the world. Mortars, uh, fire control. Um, but that's what I wanted. We were early on in the, uh, in the, in the course we were on a formation, and we, we had one of the first groups of 18 extras there. And 18 extras are not prior army. They just come in off the street, and they go to basic training, AIT, uh, jump school, selection, and then they go through the Q course, right? So they've never been in a regular unit. And there's some real good kids that came through later on. I, I, I dealt with them when I was a first sergeant, but there is some very immature young men in there who don't know how to be in the army so in, in early on in the uh in the 18 bravo course they said hey we're in formation they said hey if you're an e6 move to the left side of the formation and i'm like oh god so i moved to the to, to the their left my right and because i'm an e6 the staff sergeant and they're like okay you're squad leaders and being in a leadership position in a school sucks because you have no authority you have no power. You're just somebody to blame if something goes wrong. So so I had a whole squad that I had to account for, and that's fine. But a couple of days later, I think it was, we, we came in for formation at like 6 o'clock in the morning for PT, and this young 18 X-ray soldier was missing. And I said, you know, you report it. One man out of ranks. And I reported him. He slept in or whatever. So he comes in at 9 o'clock, and he gets his ass chewed a little bit. And then an instructor pulled me and him aside and he said to me did you wake him up this morning and I'm like no not my job and he was like you should have called him and woke him up and I'm like that ain't my job if he can't make formation that's on him he's a grown-ass man and I start arguing and I I was right and but when you're a student you're never right you're wrong so this E7 instructor 
um, who was actually a really good dude and got killed about a year or two later in Afghanistan, in Iraq, when I was there. Um, he lost his mind and he started yelling at me. And he said, you will, you, both of you will come in here. We were in, the, in like a little weapons compound. He said, both of you will come in here tonight. With a, you'll go home, get a sleeping bag, and you'll come in and you'll stay here for three nights. And you're not allowed to go home unless your house is on fire. And the, the young Nathan actually said, Roger, Sergeant. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And they were like, oh, my God. And I said, you can't confine me. You're an E7. I'm an E6. It takes like a colonel or something to confine me. That's an unlawful order, and I'm not obeying it. And he lost his shit on me. Like, he lost his mind. And I'm very, very stubborn when I dig my heels in. And it's not a good trait. But I was like, I ain't doing that. I'm not allowing you to push me around like this. And there's a lot of this goes on in the Q course when they deal with young NCOs. So he was yelling and screaming. And I was like, okay, I, I, I hear you. I'm not doing it. And he stormed off. They pulled me out of training. They put me at parade rest waiting to go talk to the NCOIC, the non-commissioned officer, a master sergeant who was in charge of the course. He wasn't the instructor. He was in charge. Of the, they pulled me out to talk to him. And they left me standing for like four hours straight. I was just getting madder and madder and madder. And I could hear them arguing in the, in the office. And that NCO was like, this MF or thinks he can do whatever he wants, and blah, 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 blah. So um, eventually... They're like going and report to this master sergeant. So I'm pissed off at this point, much more than I was before. And I, I basically storm in there waiting for a fight. And I am jacked. My adrenaline is pumped. And I'm ready to tell this guy to go screw himself. And I, I storm into his office. And he totally disarms me. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? You want a Coke or something? Grab a seat. And I was like, what? 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 What's going on? What's happening right now? And he's like, grab a seat, man. He's like, talk to me. What's going on? You're doing really well on the course. You're crushing it. Um, what's going on? And, and I start my argument. I said, look, wouldn't you rather identify dirtbags now before you spend millions of dollars training them and push them down to a team in combat? And is his team sergeant going to wake him up when he's on a team? Hold him accountable. Not my job. Blah, blah, blah. And I, I start really hammering home my argument. And this guy is like, you make a really good point. <laughs> And I start convincing him. And, I, I, you know, because of an accent, he asked me where I'm from. And then I start telling him my background, but, you know, being in special operations in the Irish Army and being in Somalia and all that. And he was like, man, we need guys like you in SF right now. But I can't take your side over one of my instructors. And I said, I totally get that. I understand because I've been a manager. I've had instructors. I, I get that point. And he said, so you'll do the punishment? And I was like, no, I won't. <laughs> And at one point, he put his head in his hands and he said, what am I going to do with your stubborn Irish ass? And he said, you see that paperwork now? That's the paperwork to relieve you from the course and send you to the 82nd Airborne. He said, you're pushing my back against a wall. You've got to give me something. And I eventually gave in and I said, okay, fine. And I, I went home and got a sleeping bag and, and probably burned my wife's ear down complaining. And then I came back in. And when I came back in, that NCO was still there. And we talked for hours, that, the NCO I see. And then the next night I tried to go in, the whole place was locked down. So I did one night of punishment. But I said to that master sergeant, I said, am I going to be targeted now? Because uh, I, I pissed that NCO. And he said, I guarantee you that will not happen. And I was never targeted. And that NCO that I got into that with was Tony Yost, who... Uh, was a freaking rock star, man. He was awesome. He made E8, went to combat, and he was in Mosul with me in 2005 when he was killed on a, on a big search for Zarqawi. But he was a great dude, and he didn't target me. Um, but it would have been easy because with, with 18 Bravos, if they want to get rid of you, they'll just say you're a safety violation on the range. They'll kick you out. It, it's, it's hard to defend against that. But I was not targeted. But the moral of that story is, is just shut the hell up and do what you're told. When you're a student, because you ha even though if you're right legally, you're wrong. You're, you're wrong, and you're going to put a target on your back, cooperate and graduate. It doesn't get you anywhere to be fighting with people. So we did all these weapons. We did freaking every weapon you could imagine, and we did classes on them, and we disassembled them and assembled them, and, and this and that, and the other moved on. And, and if I was running, I'm sure it's much, much better right now, but if I was running that class, I would do it differently, and I would try to teach people how to think and not what to think like um 
you know, weapons are weird because when you disassemble a weapon, you know, you know, you got to push this lever and pop this and then do this and, 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 and you can't, it's hard to figure out sometimes, but when you get it done, um, you're just going to forget it. So we did light weapons and submachine guns from all over the world. And then we did heavier weapons and then we did dish guns, you know, 12.7 machine guns, Russian. We did surface air missiles. We did mortars and FTC, fire control, um, we we did all that, but as soon as you did a block and you dropped it, you just you just passed on. And I would have done it differently. Um, the it, it was like a block construction test, block construction test, block construction test, and and there was very little room for for not getting through. But the weapons had been disassembled so many times that you push a couple of buttons and the damn thing fall apart. I remember I I bought a nineteen eleven after the Q course, and. 18 Bravo, man. I, I was tested on the 1911, and the ones we had in, in the in the training, you push like three buttons, the whole thing just fell to pieces. And then I bought a new one, and I couldn't get it apart. I was banging on it with a hammer. I couldn't get the pins out. You know, it was uh, it was kind of funny, but uh, we did some tactical stuff, but not that much. And your 18 Bravo is supposed to be your tactics guy, and that looks good on paper, but it's not the case unless he's got a tactical background, like he's an infantry guy. It that that just doesn't happen, right? Um, but I'll be honest, not a great course either. It was okay. Uh, a lot of PT, a lot of flutter kicks, a lot of running up and down hills. And uh, I, I would do it differently, but it wasn't terrible. It wasn't as bad as SUT. So then we moved on to uh, Robin Sage. Robin Sage is the final culmination exercise. Now, it's not final. You still have language school and seer school, but it's all changed now. But it was the final exercise. And I was not impressed so far with the Q course. I was like, okay, I'm just going to get through this crap and let me get done. I will say that Robin Sage was a phenomenal course. And again, you're getting instructors out there who are handpicked as opposed to some of the other phases. Robin Sage is a couple of weeks of training and then you infill into a fictional country called Pineland all over North Carolina. And your job, they give you a whole road to war and they build up this whole big scenario piece and all that. And you, you infiltrate, you, you parachute in or you, you drive in and you are basically building a guerrilla force up from the ground up. And when I went, they were people from the regular army, like, you know, support people that would be on a red cycle tasking and they brought them out there and they, they had a big built into an army. And... It, it was freaking phenomenal. It was great. And it was great because in scenario, in good scenario training with good NCOs, they will let you make decisions and live with the consequences. And, and I've brought that to the, to the, uh, the breakout course that we do twice a year. It's a, it's a five day scenario based exercise, exercise kind of like that, where there is left and right bumpers, obviously. Right. But you can maneuver within those, um, and you own your mistakes and you own your, 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 uh, the good stuff, right? So um, I was a pretty senior E6 when I went to Robin Sage and we infilled, we were supposed to parachute in to our thing, but the weather was atrocious. So they took us, I think, in a helicopter and dropped us off. And we, we walked, my pack was like 120 pounds. So we walked for like 24 hours to get in. Now it probably wasn't that far, but we were so freaking slow. And we maneuvered and then we linked up with a guy and he moved us into the Jeep base. And our our, our G chief was a, a guy who'd been an SF guy in Vietnam. And he was awesome. I really, really liked him and I really respected him. And we, we talked later on, but I, I really liked the way he did things. And, you know, we got into the G-Base and we set up and we had like 10, 12 men. Well, the, the Delta Force guy I talked about earlier on, he had moved on from that SUT crap and he went to the uh, the weapon sergeant course and they approached Tony Yost and said, hey, this guy didn't pass and you need to fail him. And Tony Yost was like, yeah, not my fault if you couldn't train him. I think I was a rock star, right? Well, when he infilled into Robin Sage, he was doing everything and the officers were not doing anything. So what they did as cadre, they pulled them out of that squad and they put them in our squad to force those officers to step up. Well, they didn't know, when you infill into Robin Sage, you have all this fictional money, it's called Don, it's it's paper money and it's to buy stuff at the black market and to do a lot of stuff, right? So when they pulled him out and put him into our squad, he had all their money. 
And he told me, and I was like, give me the money and don't tell anybody, right? And all through the scenario that we were in, I don't know how those guys functioned, but all through the scenario, we were a step ahead of the cadre every time because they would, they would, they would send us to the black market and there'd be a whole scenario built where we had to get MREs, right? We had to get food for our indage or they wouldn't fight. And we had to trade explosives for food. And then later on, those, those explosives would be used in IEDs against us. And there's a whole backstory. I remember going to the, because the cadre would ask me, how much money you got? Because I was the team sergeant for the whole exercise in Robin Sage. I'd be like, how much money you got? And I'd say, I got a thousand Don, right? And he, he, but I had another 10,000 in my back pocket from, from uh, the other guy. And we would go and we would be at the black market and they'd be like, 10 cases of MREs, you know, 5,000 Don. And they, they thought I didn't. I'm like, here you go, boom, boom, boom. And we loaded it up and they're all like looking around going, what the hell is going on? Um, I remember we had tons of MREs in the first G base we were in. And we were out training our indage, our soldiers and all that. We built up rapport, which is what you're supposed to do. And they told us you're going to get hit. Um, tomorrow morning really early you're going to get attacked and you're going to have to bug out of this base and go to another one like 10 kilometers away we're like appreciate the heads up so when when it got dark we didn't tell the cadre but um me and that delta guy and two other guys got duffel bags and we filled them with mres i think one of the guys that was with me in robin sage is one of the two guys that runs anthem snacks um shout out pat if you're listening um so Four of us got up in the middle of the night and we got duffel bags and we filled them with MREs, like four duffel bags. And we walked like outside the base a kilometer or two and we hit them in the wood line and we came back. And the next morning, sure as hell, we got attacked by a sizable force and we had to get everybody up and we had to break contact and move everybody out of the base and, you know, black and gold plan and all that. Well, it took us because the, the, the people that were with us were terrible, but... um it took us like all day to walk 10K, right? And we ended up carrying our gear for them and it was it was brutal. But we eventually got into the next G base and, and set up security and got our tripwires out and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, as soon as it got dark, me and those three guys walked all the way back to the old G base, picked up our four duffel bags full of MREs and humped back and we're back before morning. And the next morning, the, the, again, the scenario was built that the gorillas were like, uh, we're not, we're not, we want food or we're not working. We're not fighting for you unless you feed us. So they were ready to go on strike. And they're like, we want food. And I'm like, okay, line up. Who wants MREs? And the cadre was like, where the hell did they come from? But my cadre was mature enough to let us break the rules within the parameters of the exercise and it, like at the end he told me that you guys were, were a step ahead of us the whole time i've never seen a squad like that and he was near the end of his three years at robin sage he was like you guys are the best team squad i've ever seen oda um but he was mature enough now the problem is when you go through the q course it can't really relate some of those things if you do them with the wrong cadre they'll kick you out of the course so you got to be you got to be able to to articulate your actions and um, you got to know who will be receptive to that type of attitude and, and, and those types of things and who will not. But I thought that Robin Sage was a fantastic exercise. Had I not gone to be an instructor at sniper school, I would have loved to have been a Robin Sage instructor because I think it just gives you a lot of leeway to, to move in very, very flexible terrain. Like we did drive-by shootings in the back of trucks. We did freaking, like some of the teams hit the... Uh, the radio station in downtown LRB, some of them hit like police stations and stayed in firehouses. Like there's all these businesses get involved and uh, families, generation after generation, run as as indige um, locals and, and play parts of like uh, the auxiliary and they move you around their vehicles and they've been doing it since the 60s, since the exercise was started. And there's something about Robin Sage that really does teach you how to deal with an indigenous force because... Uh, later on, I, I worked with a lot of indigenous forces and I've seen other uh, military units try to do it and just be terrible at it. So there's something in the way they do things that is right. I'll give you two more stories and then we we'll move on from Robin Sage. When we were training before we actually infilled into it, and the point of this is respect culture, right? Respect the culture of the people you're working with. And don't bring that American attitude in, right? So we had to go see this G-Chief and... 
when we walked up there, there was four or five of us, and we they had a pattern drawn on the ground. And we didn't think nothing of it. G Chief was sitting there in front of it. And we walked up and we're standing there talking to him. And of course, somebody's got a dip in their mouth. And I think it was Pat, who's Anthem Snacks guy. And sooner or later, you put four or five American soldiers there. Somebody's going to spit on the ground and spit on their holy emblem that you're standing on. And they freaked out. And it was a great, and again, I remember to this day, and it was a long time ago, it was a great teaching point for me. Um, about respecting culture. Now, there was another time where they took me and an officer up and we had to go speak to this warlord. And we walked up there and we had M4s with blanks in them and all that. And we walked up there and his guard said, put your weapons down here and go into that building over there and he'll talk to you. And the officer was putting his weapon down. I was like, no, we're not putting our weapons down. This is long before any insider attacks ever happened in Afghanistan. But I said, no, we're taking our weapons with us. And he was like, you'll put your weapon down. I'm like, I won't put my weapon down. And he got in a big argument. And he raised his weapon and I shot him and with blanks. And the G chief came running out and I shot him too. <laughs> and I don't know if I was right or wrong. They chewed my ass. But at the end of the day, I'm not putting my weapon down in a foreign country and walking into a freaking thing. If I, I just I, That does not sit well with me. But again, I didn't get kicked out or anything. I just got an ass chew and we moved on. Um... The Robin Sage was fantastic exercise. I loved it, and I thought it really. After going through SUT, not being impressed, um, the Indian Bravo course, not being super impressed, and getting into trouble on it for running my mouth. Going into Robin Sage and being able to make decisions and live with them and think outside the box it was very, very refreshing for me. And I was like, this is why I'm here. I, I, I freaking love it. So then we graduated that portion. And we went to language school. And I had picked French. I had tried, excuse me, at the time, third group were in Africa. And French was one of the languages for Africa, obviously. So I went to French for four months. Now, I did French in high school. And I was quite good at it. And I really tried. I, did, I studied. I, I did the homework. I did the exercises because I wanted to get paid. Again, I had a couple of kids at this point. I still had three kids and I didn't have a lot of money. And my we decided my wife would stay home and watch the kids and she would work on the side. And, and that's just the decision we made. A lot of people will, will, you know, they have family to watch their kids or put them in daycare. And that's fine if that's for you. Um, I think we made the right decision because even though I still have no money, I have great kids. Um, the... So I was trying to make rank as fast as I could and I was trying to get language pay. And... For like a 2 plus 2 plus back then, you could get 150 bucks a month, which every bit helps. So I studied, 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 and I actually come out with a 2 plus 2 plus at a language school. And I was almost fluid. Like, I was right there. I, 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 and then, I, of course, I went to Iraq and Afghanistan for years, and I never spoke it again, so I, I lost it. But I still got paid for a couple of years for, for being very, very good at and, and almost fluid at, at French. So each group in SF um, is kind of geographically lined up with a different part of the world, right? So seventh group, South America, uh, and these change. First group, you know, the, the Far East and all that, uh, Korea, all that kind of stuff. Tenth group, Europe. Um, third group, Africa, then CENTCOM in Afghanistan, then back to Africa. And uh, fifth group is the Middle East, and it's been the Middle East for a long time. So um, depending on what group you're going to, you get those languages. Now, learning French is a whole lot different than learning Mandarin Chinese, which, good Lord, good, good on you. Um, and it's a big selling point for SF that we speak the language, but honestly, we work on interpreters everywhere we go. The only group I would say that really does speak the language is seventh group because they have a lot of Hispanic guys, and a lot of them, um, a lot of them do speak fluent uh, Spanish or Portuguese and because they work in, in South America and Colombia and places like that all the time. The rest of us, mm, Pashtun, Dari, um, Arabic. I, I speak a little bit of Arabic. Uh, my French has long since gone. Um, but realistically, we work through interpreters almost everywhere we go. I, I learned enough combat Arabic to, to run indige in, in Iraq, right? I can say, I can count to 10. I can say, you go over here, shoot that. Last man, get in the vehicle. You know, these, these terms that are very common in combat. Um, but the, 
fluent Arabic, it's, it's tough to keep that language up all the time, even if you get it right. And you're tested every year. And if you get a certain score, you can get paid. And if you don't, you, you fall. At the time I went to language school, you didn't need much. It was like zero plus, zero plus, get on the bus is what we used to say. And you, But the, the standard has been raised now. I think you need a one or one plus to, to graduate language school. Once language school was over, we had to SEER school. SEER stands for uh, survive, evade, resist, escape, or survive, escape, resist, evade, whatever it is. And it's a survival school. And it goes through those four phases. Um, the survival portion is, you know, traps and snares and fishing and, you know, uh, gutting animals and, and all that type of survival training. The escape, you know, they taught you how to, like, there was things where you crawl through barbed wire and prop it up. Like, it evolved after I left where they taught you how to hotwire cars and, and pick locks and all that kind of stuff. I didn't get to do that cool stuff. Um, the resistance is if you're captured and you're you're a prisoner of war. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the escape, the escape piece is picking locks and picking handcuffs and all that kind of thing, right? So um, each one had a section and you went through and you go out through the survival and, and, you know, you kill chickens and you kill rabbits and you eat them and you learn how to cook and all that kind of survival stuff. Um, but you learn how to plan, escape and evasion and, and how all those corridors and all that kind of stuff works. It's actually a pretty cool school. But near the end of it, they put you into escape and evasion mode and you're in groups of four, I think. And they push you out in, in the wood line and you have to stay in a corridor and... You have to escape and evade. Now, when I went through, every other course was just SF guys. and But the one I went on was uh, SF and pilots and people, high-risk capture people, and then some Q course guys. So my course wasn't all just SF. And we had a female on my course who did really well. She was the senior ranking officer. She was a major and she was, uh, she worked up in her headquarters writing manuals and she said she felt like she didn't belong if she didn't go to Sears school, which, good on you, because it, it's a tough school. Um, so we go in, we go into escape and evasion for three days where you have to live off the land. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, we starved. <laughs> we found some deer corn at one point. Did you ever try to eat deer corn? It's like eating rocks. We boiled it in a pot for like hours, and it didn't soften it at all. And then we end up, we found a shovel, and we put it on the fire and we cracked it like popcorn and I think we expended more calories trying to cook it than we got from eating it our instructor bought us a roadkill squirrel um not a lot of meat on a squirrel between four people just saying but we didn't eat that um our instructor brought us a couple of hot dogs and they were to be used in traps for bait and when he dropped them off he said I know what you're going to do when I leave here you're going to eat them he said, I stuck two of those hot dogs up, up in my ass before I brought them here. <laughs> so go ahead and eat them if you want. And of course, he probably didn't, but that worked because uh, we didn't eat them, even though we were starving. But it's funny about hunger. Like, you just lose your appetite after a while. And your body starts feeding off itself. And, and you're, that horrible hunger that you get at 6 o'clock in the evening if you skipped lunch, it, it's not like that anymore. I, I actually wasn't that hungry that I remember. And... You know, we have an edible plants class that, that Kate teaches here in North Carolina, which I wish I knew then. We went out and we did some edible plants and we talked about some stuff, but it went great. Um, if it was better, I probably would have been able to, to find food. The uh, but, but what a skill set to be able to find plants and, and identify what to eat and not, what, what not to eat so you don't die. That uh, edible plants class that Kate runs is awesome. She, she's such a good instructor. So we do escape and evasion for three days. And then we get linked up. I'm not going to give away too much, but we get linked up with a guy who's going to get us out of country, right? Because we're in a scenario. And um, they put us in the back of a truck and we're hiding and they're driving. And then the truck hits, an amb it hits a checkpoint and it goes off the road. And then the bad guys roll us out of the truck, right? And um, the initial shock and awe of them interrogating you and, you know, putting a hood on you and yelling at you. And there's techniques that they teach you that are classified. I'm not going to talk about, but there's certain things you don't want to do. They're just dumb. 
right? Because when you get rolled up by frontline troops, they're not training interrogators. They're taking advantage of tactical interrogation, which I've done on the battlefield. You're taking advantage of the shock and awe that that prisoner feels from getting rolled up, and you're trying to get information right there before he gets processed and pushed back where he gets a little more comfortable and he's with more professional interrogators right you're trying to take advantage of that shock and awe so not the time to say the wrong thing not the time to be an ass because you're dealing with guys who are hyper their adrenaline is spiked and they'll just shoot you because you're you just were in a fight with them right so we get rolled up um they hood us they flex cuff us and now there's so much intelligence out there about Sears School. People know exactly what goes on and all that, maybe because of podcasts like this. But I didn't know much about Sears School. I heard they hit you, but I really didn't really believe it. And I was like, yeah, maybe they slapped me. And I, I, I considered myself a pretty tough guy. I've fought in martial arts for years. I've fought in the ring. I, you know, I've been in a lot of fights. So um, they had a hood on me. As soon as they whipped the hood off, this asshole hit me a slap in the face that shit hurt man i saw sparks and i think it was shock too he hit me hard and my 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 legs kind of buckled a little bit i felt a little embarrassed now i hadn't eaten in a couple of days and i'd been on this escape and evasion thing um but that shit hurt and then they roll you up into this prison camp that's uh in North Carolina, but it's it's classified, right? But you go in there and you start about three days of being in prison and getting um, all kinds of stuff done to you and psychologically and, and, and there's huge lessons learned, but they're not learned until you really come out and it's kind of mistake-based learning and not immediately... Um, obvious what the teaching point is right so they have all the white noise playing the babies crying on the big speaker i had to work out there that must be awful um and then they 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 separate you by religion and then they go to to kind of tear everybody's religion apart and and the the, the teaching point is you don't let them separate you all stay together because you're all a unit right um but i don't want to give away too much they stripped us naked one time and they were looking for tattoos, and tattoos give away a lot about a person. And guys have Ranger Regiment tattoos, and I have one tattoo now, which is a team tattoo, but I didn't have it at the time, so I had no tattoos, so I was easy. Um, one guy had badass tattooed across the small of his back. He had, he had badass tramp stamp tattooed on his lower back, and they had a field day with him. They were saying, it's a warning label for the homosexuals. The ass is no good. <laughs> They, and people would argue with them. And I'm like, stop arguing. Like, if, if, you're, if you're talking about my religion and you bring me up front and you say, or you, you ask for volunteers and you say, who here thinks their religion or God will protect them? And I'm like, that's a red flag. I'm not taking that bad. People would put their hands up. And then they'd bring them up at the front of the class and just beat their ass. I'd be like, God, protect them. And just beat them down. So there's a lot of lessons learned. Uh, respect costs you nothing lack of respect will cost you everything in that situation and you learned as you went now I, I tell you I was not good at it I got my ass beat a couple of times and I wasn't getting it and then a guy gave me some advice in the we were in the yard and we weren't supposed to talk to each other and he just gave me a couple of little tidbits and I was like oh that makes so much sense and then the next time I did it I I, I, I did well and I got back but it's funny because you know if you have people doing, you know, flutter kicks and push-ups, and and they're giving you hints. They're like, oh, these ones are strong. We will keep going. And the answer is you're supposed to, like, fall down and not be able to do one push-up because you're so weak. But there's guys there, especially Ranger Regiment guys, man, they're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And, uh, guys, it's not a PT test. Stop doing push-ups. <laughs> it's so funny because you got that A-type personality. That it's, it's funny. But the female in charge of us was uh, she got beat down hard and she crushed it, man. She did so well. I was very impressed with her. Um, she did really well. And it, it, it's it's not an easy school. Um, they, maybe that's the one school that I went to that I really, that maybe might have been a little different than I thought it was going to be. But uh, huge lessons learned. They pull you out after after three days. You do ceremony. And, and so you've been six days of no food. You lose a lot of weight. And... Um, they oh, they give you rice and, and some fish heads or some crap in there, but it's nasty. But um, 
after you graduate the next day, they sit you down and they individually counsel you on your performance. You go through all that. So at the end of that, um, I'm done. I graduate the Q course and I'm done. So all I have to do is go back to, um, to student company, out process and go to third group. And third group's in combat at this time. It's 2003. So I'm like, the invasion of Iraq is, has has happened at this point too. So I missed the invasion of Iraq and I missed the invasion of Afghanistan. I'm pissed. So I'm ready to go to war. And I go back to student company and they have us in formation and they, they call out like 12 names and they say, hey, if we call your name out, move to the left. And my name's there. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And because they, like I said earlier, they pulled all the instructors, uh, not all the instructors, they pulled many of the instructors out of teaching on the Q course to back to their units to deploy and they augmented with National Guard guys, then they didn't have enough still. So they came up with this plan that they're going to take Q course graduates with an infantry background and make them AIs at SUT, at Small Unit Tactics. And they came up with a multiple courses of action. That was one. The other one was to PCS 11 Bravos from the regular army there to run that. The other one was to hire civilians to do it. And this is day one they came up with. So just graduated the Q course. Um, the last place I want to go is packed to Camp McCall. Um, but they're like, you guys are going to go back out and be AIs for a year. Now, it wasn't a year. I was only there for a couple of months. But it was devastating, especially when you, when you wanted to go to war. And it wasn't even considered a SWIC tour. So we went to third group. We in process. We got all our gear for war. And then we had to go back out. And Chuck Ritter was with me. Chuck is a, a sergeant major. He's the deputy commandant of the NCO Academy. I did a podcast with Chuck recently. And uh, he's been shot and blown up a bunch of times. Chuck's a great dude. But, but uh, we were out there together and we were talking about it. They brought us into the uh, the SWIC, which is the Special War First Center in School, CSM, the Command Sergeant Major. And he was going to talk to us. And he brought us all in the room and he started blowing smoke. And he started saying, uh, you guys were the best ones we could find to be the most professional instructors. And, and I had all my arguments ready that why this is bad for my career and everything. And one kid got in there before me. He said, Sergeant Major, because they, they just told us we're the best guys we could ever find. And this kid said, Sergeant Major, I failed SUT when I went through. I had to be recycled. <laughs> And the sergeant major said, well, this is a good opportunity for you to brush up on your skills, which I was like, this is, you're never getting out of this. It's not going to happen. So um, suck it up, buttercup, go back out because you're in the army and you do what you're told. Basically, you have no say. You can complain and you can, but you had to do it. So back out to Camp McCall and assigned to one of the companies training small unit tactics for the next class. It's funny because the next class or the one after that came through, Mike Glover came through and I was instructor there. Um, the, now, I was lucky because the, the, the section or platoon or company that I was put into, the NCOs that were there already were actually pretty squared away. Some of the other guys, because there was 12 of us, were put in other sections and the, uh, the, the NCOs that were there were just assholes and they treated them like garbage and they told them that this is phase seven of the Q course. You're not an instructor, you're a student, and blah, blah, and treated them like crap the whole time. That didn't happen with me. I wouldn't have allowed it to happen anyway, but that didn't happen. Me and Chuck went to this other company and they were pretty cool to us. Um, we, we were only there for two classes, actually. We were there, the first class were AIs and the second class, I was the the primary instructor and Chuck was my AI because he was an E5 and I was an E6. And um, I tried not to be that instructor that was yelling and screaming and, and treating people like garbage the whole time. I, I tried to train, coach and mentor people and bring them along and get them to... Uh, but it did get, I would say, it did get frustrating because when you have a squad, let's say a 12-man squad, and you have two officers and two E7s and E6s in there, and they're supposed to be at 50% secure, and you go in, they're all asleep. You can't help but get mad. I mean, you're trying to be a Green Beret, man. Play the game. Um, but I, I tried not to be that instructor who was just an ass and yelling and screaming at all times. Now, I did see behind the curtain a little bit. And what was going on at that time Again, you had a bunch of instructors didn't want to be there and they wanted to take it out on the students. So in some cases, they would write a student's evaluation before they went in the field, right? So, hey, I'm going to fail this guy because I don't like him because he screwed up a couple of times. So they'd write his evaluation before he actually infilled. 
which is kind of jacked up. And then let's say part of the evaluation as your squad leader eval is you have to know your position at all times within 250 meters, right? Well, if I drop artillery similars at you and I run you all over the place, and then I ask you, you're not going to know where you are exactly. Nobody would. And that's a way to fail you. Now, the flip side also happened where if you're a good guy and you're, squal- you're solid and you're squared away and I'm grading you on tr- crossing a danger area, then if you screw that up, then maybe I won't count that one. I'll just grade you on the next one and I'll count the one that you did well because I know you're squared away and this is just to check the box. But there was a horrible attitude of disgruntled instructors who just wanted to fail as many students as they could. I I don't get this hate for students that I've seen a couple of times. These guys are trying to be you. They're trying to go serve their country. And this is 2003. They're under no illusion of what's at the end of this pipeline. They're going to war. When all these disgruntled instructors went in the pipeline, there was no war. They were going, sunning themselves in sunny beaches a lot of times. Um, So these guys were signing up in big numbers to go fight the enemy. Fucking stop treating them like crap. It drives me crazy, and it drives me crazy to this day. Um, When I was an SUT, I was, as an instructor, I was driving to the range one day, and I'll tell this story, and then I'll wrap it up there. I was driving to the range one day. I was meeting Chuck Ritter at the range. We were going to McKellar's Lodge, which was on post, but it wasn't behind the gate. It was on land, right? And I'm driving uh, way, way far away from base, but it was on military land, and MPs stop me, and I'm like, crap, and I have my gun in the car, but it's unloaded, it's in that blue case you buy it in, it's in the back with my ammo and my targets, very obvious I'm going to the range, so this MP stops me for speeding, and I was speeding, I was doing 62 and a 50 or something like that, so he has, uh, he's an E5, and he has a specialist from the National Guard with him, and he's trying to press him. And he gets out, and this guy had the cop gloves on, you know, the leather gloves, and he was like, Mr. Cool. And he gets out, and he arrests me for speeding. And I'm like, freaking great. And he pulls me out, he searches me, and then he asks me, is there anything in the car? And I say, I have a gun in the car, uh, but it's unloaded, and it's in the back of my way to the range. He runs my registration, and what happened was we'd bought a new vehicle recently, and because we had, uh, our daughter was born right before I deployed in 2004, but we'd bought a new vehicle, we bought a minivan and traded in my Jeep Cherokee. And they, it was registered, but they, they never switched the tags. The dealer never switched the tags, but they charged me for it. They fixed it later on, right? So when he ran the plate, it came up as a Jeep Grand Cherokee instead of the minivan that we had, right? And so that was a red flag. I didn't have my insurance card on me, but I had insurance. So that was another one. And so he arrests me and charges me with speeding, uh, giving a fictitious registration, no insurance, and carrying a concealed weapon. Complete bogus, like most of it. Um, And tried to make an example of me for some reason. Like um, he actually said to me at one point, he said, you're lucky you told me about the gun when I asked you because if I had to find it and he put his hand on his gun, we would have taken this to the next level. And I was like, oh, man, I am about to snap your... Never mind. Okay, so I was like, oh, God, this is going to be bad. So they arrest me, handcuffs, put me in a car, take me into the police station, process me. Uh, this guy lies. He's like, he had a gun hidden on his person. I'm like, that's a fucking lie. I did not. And 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 um, But they went and they got my sergeant major who came out there like a bull to come chew my ass. So he came and got me out of the police station. And we go outside and he goes to start yelling. I'm like, stop. Let me tell you what happened. And I was like, I was on the way to the range with an unloaded gun, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, my God. He's like, I have two guns in the car right now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um, I had to go to court in downtown Fayetteville. And when I was in court, they called me for court. But they, I wasn't on the docket or whatever they call it. So they didn't call me. So I go and talk to the district attorney. And he says, uh, oh, before I went to court, I went and I got the dealer to write a letter to say that it was their fault. They didn't switch the tags. And I got my insurance card. So those two got dropped. So it was speeding and carrying a concealed weapon. Um, 
Then uh, I went to court, didn't call me. The district attorney said, come to my office next week. I come to the office next week and he drops it 10 miles an hour and I, I pay a $50 fine. And because it was less than 15 over or whatever. And then I just had this gun charge that hung over me for like a year, actually a couple of years. Uh, but six months later to give me my gun back, no charges were ever filed. But every single time I tried to get a security clearance, I tried to get an ammo handler's card, this thing would red flag. And I had to bring it up every time when I was getting my security clearance just because this little jackass, and I'd love to meet him again, man. But, um, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a lot. So my daughter was born in Fort Bragg uh, in 2004, and I deployed to Afghanistan like two months later, I think. And um, I'll be honest, my daughter was born... And she was probably four before I started bonding with her. I didn't see her for the next couple of years, except for a little bit here and a little bit there. And and she would not go to me for anything. And we had no bond. And it took a long time to rebuild that bond because I was in and out of war for so long. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I, I make a mental note. I will... Um, so my first deployment to Afghanistan is where I'm going to start the next time uh, i appreciate you guys listening if you drop me some questions i'm bad at answering questions on youtube but i'll, I'll take note of them and, and talk about them if i can um but i'll get in there and, and try to answer some a little better um okay guys till the next time thanks bye